Good day to you. In this module, we're going to build on our discussion of uh, stress and strain and the, uh, and the measurement of the Young's modulus, this uh, fundamental property of materials, biological and otherwise, that, uh, and that, that, uh, that relate uh, uh, stress and strain to one another. Now, the Young's modulus is an interesting thing uh, to begin with, but it has lots of practical applications, uh, lots of fun applications uh, as well. And uh, what I'd like to do uh, here is to uh, go through some of the ways that you can use the Young's modulus to learn some interesting things and learn some interesting ways of, of, of describing how uh, biological materials work in actual living systems. Okay, the first uh, uh, fun thing that we're going to uh, look at is the way that you can use the stress-strain curve to measure a quantity known as the work of extension. Now, we've mentioned that uh, before in another module that if you take an elastic material and you deform it, you're going to end up, uh, you're going to end up, that's going to uh, uh, imply that there's a certain force operating uh, on that object. And so we can take a very, very simple object here. This is a, uh, this is a pen on a rubber band. And obviously, if I put more force on it, we're going to deform that rubber band. It's going to go down, 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 and so forth. All right. Now, for me to be able to do this, I had to put work into this system. I had to use my muscles to pull down this uh, pen, and, uh, and, and that has generated a force at my hand, and that is what keeps this uh, down. Now, when I have uh, done this, uh, I, have, uh, I have done work on this system. I've done work on this rubber band. And we can use the Young's modulus to actually uh, estimate what that is. Let's come over here to a graph, again, of strain versus stress, dimensionless units of pressure. And let's say that we're dealing with a nice, uh, well-behaved material that has a constant Young's modulus along the, uh, the degree of strain that we have imposed upon it. Now, if we take a length at resting and we then measure the stress and strain at the strained length. Then, obviously, as we move this down, there's going to be a constant relationship between stress and strain. But the work that we have done on this can actually be measured by the area under our stress-strain curve. And so this area over here is called the work of extension. Now this, pres this presents a very, very interesting property of elastic materials and this will become relevant when we uh, delve into the aspects of locomotion. Namely, when I take this device and I do work on this elastic system and I pull it down, this is a store of potential energy that, is, that, is, uh, that can be tapped to be able to do work. And so by principles of conservation of energy, I do work in the system. There's energy in there to be stored. And just to make sure nothing gets uh, damaged here, if I release it, then work can be done to actually accelerate that device and, uh, and, and do work on it. And so one of the things that uh, you can uh, do with the uh, stress-strain curve is to actually uh, quantify what the amount of energy is that you've stored in something and, uh, and, and therefore uh, enable you to, uh, to quantify how much work can be tapped to do, uh, how much energy can be stored to, to do work later. Now, obviously, when you're looking at different kinds of materials, then certain kinds of materials are good stores of energy uh, compared to other kinds of materials. And specifically, we can come along to our stress-strain curve over here, epsilon versus sigma. Okay, And if we deform one kind of a substance, let's call it a sea anemone, for example, that's going to have a small Young's modulus of elasticity. And we compare this with the amount of energy that we can store in, say, a tendon. Uh, we saw that the, uh, that the uh, tendon has, uh, has a much uh, larger modulus of elasticity than does the sea anemone. Then if we deform both of those by a certain amount, 
from L0 to L, then clearly the squishy anemone is going to store less energy for us than will the much more elastic tendon. And therefore, if we're looking to some kind of an object as a, uh, as a, as a storehouse of uh, potential energy that we put into it, then clearly we want something that has, uh, has the highest uh, modulus of elasticity as possible. Now, in the case of this uh, kind of relationship here, uh, uh, this has been put to uh, interesting use throughout history, uh, uh, most notably uh, by the Romans. Uh, the Romans, of course, were, were very, uh, were very uh, aggressive. They uh, had a very expansive empire. And uh, when they encountered cities that didn't really want to come under Roman rule, they had to uh, somehow conquer them. And of course, one of the classic uh, things in Roman, uh, Roman and, and Greek literature, for that matter, is the siege of a, of a walled city. And the Romans were very ingenious at figuring out how to use, uh, how to build uh, the devices that can actually break down the defenses. And one of the interesting devices was a, was a, uh, a, a device called a ballista, uh, B-A-L-L-I-S-T-A. -L -L uh, you can do some uh, Google search on this and look for uh, ballistas, and uh, there are all kinds of fun videos uh, operating there. On, uh, on, uh, you can find on YouTube and places like that. And the ballista was kind of an ingenious device. It consisted of two big plates that were separated from one another by post, by columns. And in between these two platforms, they took large tendons and they coiled them up, separating the top plate from the bottom plate. And what they did then was they took large beams of wood and they strung them through here, through these kinks in these uh, coils of tendon. And this, these were attached, of course, to a little basket in which you can put a big rock. And what the Romans did to be able to uh, operate this ballista is that they, would, they, they had uh, levers and, uh, and winches that could actually move, move these uh, um, these, uh, these arms inward, and when they released them, the arms would spring back outward, flinging the rock towards the, uh, towards the, um, uh, towards the wall, and the idea there, of course, was to break down the wall. And these were very, very effective, uh, effective devices. Uh, they could, they could uh, fling 100-pound uh, rocks uh, over several hundred meters or so, and, uh, they, and in this way, they could actually break down, the, uh, break down quite nicely the defenses against buildings. And uh, again, we can't be flinging around rocks in, in this uh, studio, but uh, we can illustrate the concept of a ballista just by taking a pen here and holding it up like so, and obviously we can get that uh, spinning and uh, doing work on that. And the, the Romans, of course, choose, chose tendon because they uh, knew, not so much scientifically, but uh, through experience, that the amount of energy that they could store in a ballista uh, was very large when they used tendons as opposed to ropes or other kinds of, uh, other kinds of uh, materials. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the ability of elastic materials to store energy to do work is uh, correlated uh, quite directly to the Young's modulus of elasticity. Okay, now uh, let's take a look at some other things, interesting things that we can do here. Uh, one thing that you can uh, look at here, especially with the stress train, strain curve, is to examine a quantity known as the work of fracture. Now, in natural selection as well as in uh, engineering, uh, uh, a very important thing to know and uh, a very important determiner of design is how much uh, stress you can put into an object, how much strain it can bear before it falls apart and breaks. And the stress strain curve, the stress strain curve enables us to actually estimate what the work of fracture is. And it's a quite simple uh, process, intuitively obvious. If you uh, take an unstrained material and you, uh, and you put sufficient strain on it, eventually that material is going to fail. It's going to break apart. 
which will indicate with a little uh, star there. And of course, when it breaks apart, it's no longer uh, bearing a load. That is, it's no longer carrying a, uh, carrying a, 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 a stress. And this will basically fall back down to zero. All right, now just as you can use the area under the stress strain curve to estimate the amount of energy that's stored in an, an elastic deformation, you can also use it to estimate how much work you have to do on something to get it to fail. So if you start with an unstrained length over here and you move up to the, uh, the uh, strain at which it fails, then you'll end up with an area under this curve right here, and the area under the curve is the so-called work of fracture. Now, the work of fracture is uh, kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing to know. And uh, uh, again, there are lots of different kinds of uh, measurements of these things. Let's, uh, let's put up some uh, measurements here for us. And uh, if we look at the work of fracture and we compare uh, different kinds of materials, let's start again with steel. Steel has a work of fracture anywhere from 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth joules per meter cubed. And that is the uh, typical way that work of fracture is, is designated as, a, as, a, as an energy density, uh, basically. Now, if we look at uh, different kinds of biological materials, we see some interesting uh, patterns. Uh, first of all, if we look at uh, teeth, let's take a look at teeth first. You remember that the modulus of elasticity of teeth was really quite large, and uh, and of course the uh, the, the question uh, might arise uh, if uh, the modulus of elasticity, Young's modulus, is an indicator of how much energy you can store in a material. Why is it that the Romans went to tendons rather than teeth? And the answer here is in the work of fracture. Uh, teeth are very, very tough. They're very stiff, but uh, they tend to fail uh, quite, uh, quite uh, easily. And uh, anyone who's been hit in the mouth uh, with a rock or something has experienced this quite directly. If you look at the, uh, the work of failure of teeth, you find it's quite a bit smaller. It's about 200 uh, joules per meter cubed. So even though teeth are very, very tough, uh, very strong, very uh, stiff, nevertheless, they're fairly weak. Uh, they, can, they can fracture quite easily. You don't have to do a lot of work on them to get them to fall apart. If you look at bone, again, the same question arises. Uh, if tendon is so good but bone is stiffer, uh, why is that the tendon was the natural choice? Well, again, the work, the answer to this lies in the work of fracture that has to be done. A bone is obviously much more uh, resilient uh, than, or I, I should say, tougher uh, than, uh, than uh, teeth are. Uh, you're talking about a, uh, a work of fracture that's about an order of magnitude larger than that for teeth. But uh, again, bone is much stiffer than tendons. And again, why did the Romans uh, choose tendons rather than, uh, rather than bones? And we see here that when we look at tendon, uh, here's the answer for us. You're looking at a work of fracture of about 20,000 uh, joules per meter cubed there. All right, and so uh, that's, uh, that's another one of the interesting things that you can do with, uh, with, this, uh, with the uh, stress-strain curve. A third thing is that uh, so far we've been looking at fairly well-behaved materials, uh, that is, uh, materials that have a stress-strain curve in which the relationship between uh, strain and stress is a nice linear relationship, okay? Constant Young's modulus throughout the range of the, ma of the material, range of strain that the material will experience. If you look at most biological materials, on the other hand, you find that they actually are not so well behaved. You typically have a stress strain curve in a natural material, a biological material, that looks something like this. That is, at low degrees of strain, it's a fairly compliant uh, tissue, but at high degrees of strain, it gets to be very, very stiff. And there's lots of reasons for this. You can have mixing of different kinds of materials, such as collagen or elastin, uh, re relatively stiff versus relatively elastic uh, materials. Another reason is that uh, when you uh, strain biological materials, what you're usually doing is you're straightening out little kinks in the, in, in the collagen fibers or the fibrous uh, proteins that give a material its strength. If you look at the way that these things are oriented at the microscopic level, they form complicated meshes, and when you pull on them, they 
they tend to straighten out. And during that period where it tends to straighten out, the, uh, the, the uh, stress strain curve can be fairly shallow. It's a fairly compliant material over that, but when it gets stiff like that, when all the kinks are worked out, it tends to get very, very stiff. And when that happens, then you get into this range where you have a very stiff material. Okay, so one of the interesting things that you can do with this stress strain curve is that you can uh, quantify uh, how it is that uh, the mechanical properties of the structure, be it tendon or bone or whatever, how those things uh, interact with the typical kinds of strains and stresses that are imposed upon them in nature. And when you do that, you get into some very interesting issues of biological design and how is it that uh, organisms become designed in particular ways. Okay, another thing that you can do with the stress strain curve is that you can measure the efficiency of an object at being an engine for storing potential energy uh, under elastic deformation. And again, let's take our stress strain curve over here and let's look at what happens when we stretch the material and what happens when we let it go. So here is our stress strain curve when we stretch a material. We move it from its unstrained value over here up to its strained value over here, okay? And it, we're going to pretend it doesn't matter what shape this is, but we're just going to pretend that it's a nonlinear uh, relationship between uh, stress and strain. That is, the Young's modulus is not constant throughout the deformation. And as we move up this curve, we're going to be doing a certain amount of work on that system. And that is going to correspond to a work of extension. That is, this is the storage of energy in this system. If we then release it and allow it to release its energy, we might get a curve that looks something like this. And this is what happens when you're releasing it. This is the work that you put in, in red. In green, this is the work you get out. Now, most materials, and this includes things like steel, but also especially biological materials, uh, uh, they often have this kind of uh, dissociation between the stress strain curve during extension and the stress strain cur curve during the release of the tension. This phenomenon, that is this disparity, is known as hysteresis. And hysteresis is important because it enables us to gauge what the efficiency of this system is. And let's see how to do that. If you measure the area under the curve during the, uh, during the release of energy, then you're going to calculate a work value, just as you did when you, we measured the area under the curve uh, in red over here. And that area is going to be the work released. Now there's going to be a difference between the two, and that's going to be the red area minus the green area. And this is going to be energy lost, and it's going to come out as heat. And so the, uh, the efficiency of an object as a, uh, as, a, uh, as a store of potential energy is determined by the difference between the work put in during extension and the work that is released during the release of it. And the difference is going to be heat. And you can demonstrate th this to yourself quite nicely. Uh, rubber is one of these uh, substances, and here's a rubber band. And if you move this back and forth like this, as you, as you put energy in, you're putting a certain amount of energy in. As you release it, you're getting a certain amount of energy out. But when you put a quantity of energy in, you're not going to get the same amount of energy out. And the difference is going to end up heating up this rubber band. And so if you move a rubber band back and forth like this, and you put it against your skin, you'll feel that, that the rubber band gets somewhat warm. And the warmth that you're feeling is this heat that's being released here. Okay, and this uh, quantity right here, that is the efficiency of, of, the, uh, of these uh, systems to be able to uh, recover energy, uh, has a special name. It's known as resilience. And if we look at the different kinds of uh, uh, biological materials out there that, are, that, that have resilience, uh, uh, let's put some, uh, 
uh, some values up here. Steel, of course, is a very, uh, very resistant material. You're talking about resiliences up to 99 to 100 uh, percent uh, at certain strains, uh, uh, most, uh, most, mostly towards 100 percent uh, range because steel is uh, almost a perfectly elastic uh, substance. Not quite, but, uh, but close. If you look at the principal material that makes up tendons, that is collagen, then you find that uh, collagen is a very resilient material. That is, it has a, uh, it has a resilience on the order of about 93% uh, or so. If you compare that with uh, certain kinds of elastic materials, for example, and invertebrates, the principal elastic uh, uh, fiber that exists there is known as elastin. Uh, you're looking here at, uh, at uh, resiliences of about 76%. So even though elastin is more elastic, less stiff than, uh, than, than uh, collagen and can store more uh, energy, uh, nevertheless, it's not quite as resilient. Uh, there's quite a bit of heat that's, uh, that, that's lost during extension and uh, release. Uh, silk is a surprising substance. Uh, you'd expect silk to be quite strong because we keep hearing things about how strong silk is. But if you look at the resilience of silk, it's actually quite poor. It's about 35% uh, or so. And this reflects the fact that uh, silk is actually kind of a liquid crystal that deforms very easily over under strain. And then finally, there's, a, there's an invertebrate elastic material that's more or less equivalent uh, in function to elastin. But the remarkable thing about that is that it has a very, very high uh, resilience. It has a resilience on the order of about 97%. So uh, the ability of an organism to be able to recover stored energy from uh, resilin is much, much greater than it is in collagen or in elastin. Now there's an interesting uh, 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 um, application of this that we can uh, talk about, and this is related to fleas. And here's a little flea right there, okay. And the flea has legs that the flea has to uh, uh, contract and change uh, shape or change position quite quickly to get it to uh, uh, be able to jump up. And the interesting thing about fleas is that they're so small that their muscles themselves cannot power the jump of a flea. So what the flea does is it has a little pad, a little stop on its exoskeleton. It has a little pad of resilin right there. And the flea uses its muscles to pull this leg up. And the muscles act fairly slowly, not quickly enough to power the, uh, power the jump of the flea themselves. But what the uh, muscles do do is that they very slowly press the leg up against the resilin pad. And as they put it up against the resilin pad, it stores energy in there. And there's a little catch mechanism. And when the uh, flea is ready to jump, it simply releases the, uh, re releases the catch. And then all the stored energy in the resilin can be released all at once, much, much faster than the muscle can release it. And when that happens, you get a very strong impulse of uh, force directed uh, through the flea's legs against the ground. And the flea can then jump up uh, uh, to quite a high value. But it can't do it with its muscles alone. It requires uh, uh, the storage of potential energy in this pad, a very resilient resilin. Okay, well that's all for today, and uh, we will see you another time. Good day. <laughs>